Welcome to the Deeper Dive Podcast, brought to you by the OC Church of Christ. Let's dive deep into God's Word, learning new insight and taking a fresh look at the verses that impact our daily lives. Today, we will begin an 11-part study of the Minor Prophets. Today, John Oakes will be leading us through the book of Hosea. So, let's go to the book of Hosea. I'm going to give a little bit of background so you kind of know the context of what's going on in the book of Hosea. We're going to, um, we're going to be, the sermon is going to be from the first three chapters of Hosea. The word Hosea means, uh, it means salvation or deliverance. In fact, Yeshua, Jesus, Hosea, that's really the same name. Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom. This is in the period of the divided kingdom, the northern kingdom, also known as Samaria or Israel. The southern kingdom was known as Judah. It, he's uh, around, actually, let's read Hosea 1.1. 1, 1. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Biri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So this is, Uzziah died 739 B.C. Hosea ruled until around um, 686 B.C. So uh, Hosea is roughly 740 to 710 B.C. Now, for some of you, Giving you that number tells you very little, but this is a period when the northern kingdom had had quite a bit of of riches and wealth and success, but because of the sins that Hosea is calling Israel on, God is going to bring the Assyrians, and the Assyrians ultimately, by the time Hosea finishes his ministry, the northern kingdom will be completely destroyed because of the sins of Israel. So Hosea is a contemporary of Amos. Amos was from Judah, but he preached to the northern kingdom. He's also a contemporary of Isaiah and Micah, 8th century, second half of 8th century prophets. So he's speaking to the northern kingdom, which of the two kingdoms is far more into idolatry and sin. In fact, they're basically on the highway to hell. They're on the highway to destruction. So not a really fun job to have Hosea's job, especially Amos's job, which is to preach that vengeance of God is coming because of their sin. So the situation is this. In fact, let's go to uh, Hosea 4, verse 1 through 3, and we'll get kind of a sense of what the situation is. Oops, I forgot to start my recording. That's okay. We'll just keep going and we'll miss the first five minutes of the recording. No big deal. So let's go to Hosea 4, verses 1 through 3. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There's only cursing, lying and murder, stealing and adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land dries up and all who live in it waste away the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, and the fish in the sea are swept away. And the first half of this, it kind of sounds like <laughs> Bakersfield. It sounds like the world today. But he's saying because of this idolatrous, sinful, out-of-control behavior, God's judgment is coming on the land, and the land will be wasting of the way, and the beasts of the fields and the birds of the sky will be swept away. And uh, within a short period of time of this prophecy, that's exactly what happened to the northern kingdom. And what he's describing, it sounds kind of like today, it sounds to me a lot like Romans 3, 10 through 18. Let's read that. Romans 3, 10 through 18. As it is written, let me give you a minute to get there. Romans 3, 10 through 18. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery marks their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's the unfortunate reality of the world we live in. People might say, oh, I'm not that bad. 
Well, okay. I think a lot of those things are exactly what you and I are outside of Christ. So, the theme then of Hosea is God's faithful, unrelenting love, even in spite of our unfaithfulness to God. You know, we often say that God's love is unconditional, and I think really, probably, that's not even true. (laughs) In fact, we're going to see in Hosea chapter 3 that actually, it depends on how you define his love being conditional or not. But one thing it certainly is, is unrelenting. So that's the title of our sermon this morning. The unrelenting love of God. In the book of Hosea, God uses two very, very powerful metaphors to describe our relationship with him. The first metaphor, which is in the first three chapters, is the metaphor of a faithful husband and an unfaithful wife. Actually, a wife who becomes a prostitute. And in this, in this metaphor, Hosea represents God, and Gomer, his wife, represents Israel, but it also represents us as humans and us individually as well. Then, next week, we'll have a different metaphor. It's interesting that God uses two different, very, very powerful metaphors to kind of help us to get, to understand how he feels about us and what our relationship with him ought to be. So the second metaphor will be from Hosea 11 and 12, in which uh, basically God is a loving parent. Whether it's a mother or father is not clear, actually. God is the loving parent, and we are the recipients of this affectionate love from the parent. So let's read Hosea one, two through three, and we're going to set the stage here. This is a very emotional section of Hosea. There's a lot of pathos here. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her, for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. This is unbelievable. This is spectacular. This is incredible. Hosea's life is used by God as a symbol. You know, this is a tough job. This is at the beginning of his ministry. Almost all the prophets, at the very beginning of the book, you'll have the scene of their being commissioned as a prophet. So this is the scene of Hosea's commissioning. Hosea, I want you to be my prophet, and here's what you're going to do. You're going to marry an unfaithful woman. And the amazing thing is, Hosea actually does it. Again, remember, in this story, Hosea is a, is used by God. It's clear. But when you get to chapter 3, it'll become obvious. Here, Hosea represents God, and Gomer represents Israel in the context, for sure. But really, all humans, us corporately and us individually, How would you like to be the prophet of God if his plan is to use your life, your actual life, as a as a negative symbol about God's relationship with us? That's a pretty tough job. So he tells Hosea to go and marry an adulterous wife. Now, when he married her, he wasn't adulterous. In fact, he'll have three children. The first child is going to be his child. So he goes, he marries her, and he gives birth to a son, and then we'll see how that goes. But um, So basically then, God uses the life of Hosea as a sort of an in-your-face symbol to represent our relationship with God. And in, in the book of Amos, the sin that God is really pointing out is injustice. It's the wealthy and those in power taking advantage of those who don't. That's not the principal sin the prince in, in Hosea. The principal sin in Hosea is unfaithfulness to God. It is unfaithfulness to the covenant love that he has for us. In fact, I, I didn't really mention it, but if, you go, if we go back to Hosea 4 verse 1, that's what it's in charging them with, is unfaithfulness. Now, I've been using this word has said quite a bit. 
And we're, it's going to keep up. It, it, it keep coming up. It's going to come up in Hosea 6.6. 6. It comes up several times in these first three chapters. So uh, what we're talking about is God's faithful love. Faithful love is unrelenting love. And, but God's people have been the exact opposite of that. And we go back to Romans 3, 1 through, or 10 through 18. And that was us. We were unfaithful to God. Would you be willing to marry somebody that you knew for a fact was going to be unfaithful to you? I wouldn't. So why does God have Hosea do that? Because that's exactly what God did. You have to understand that. God married a woman who became unfaithful to him. And who's that? It's Israel. It's Judah. But isn't that, isn't that me? Isn't that you? God gave me so many things. And we're, we're, we'll see that in, in next week's sermon in, in Hosea 11. Feel free to read that ahead of time. God treated us with amazing love. And what did we do? We became unfaithful. We, we went after sex, essentially, with whatever moved virtually. So let's read a little bit more here. Uh, it, Hosea's job doesn't get any easier. All right, let's read verse 4 through 9. And we'll go through it. We're going to see the three different children. Each one has a certain symbolic meaning. Then the, then the Lord said to Hosea, call him Jezreel. That's that first son, the one who was indeed actually a son. Call him Jezreel, because I'll soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel. And I'll put an end to the kingdom of Israel. And that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. And by the way, just, you know, there were two different battles at Jezreel, one of which had already happened, which was under Jehu. And the second one is going to happen just maybe about six years after this prophecy. I'll talk about that later. Then Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call her lo Ruhama, which means not loved. For I will sh- no longer show love to Israel that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or horses and horsemen, but I, the Lord will God, will save them. By the way, this is an exact prophecy that will be fulfilled. Come to our Isaiah class. You'll learn about that. After she had weaned lo Ruhamah, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, call him Lo-Ami, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Whew, pretty tough stuff. So Gomer bears a son for Hosea to Hosea, and God says, call him Jezreel. And Jezreel means vengeance. Now, it turns out Jezreel is an interesting word. It has two meanings. It means vengeance. It also means God plants. And and God through Hosea is going to use the double meaning of this word to show that Jezreel is going to take on a new meaning for those who repent, for those who are in the remnant. So how would you like to have a kid and you name him vengeance? Pretty tough stuff. It's like you have a kid and you name him, I don't know, I was trying to find an equivalent, but the U.S. hasn't had these kinds of defeats that Israel's had. I thought of maybe name him Little Bighorn or maybe name your son Titanic or something like that. And going around their entire life with the name of just about the worst disaster that anybody's ever heard of. And his ma- name literally means vengeance. Why would God do that? Because he's trying to teach us about our relationship with him. Because the bottom line is, because of the sin we already read about in uh, Hosea chapter 4, um, Israel's relationship with God is giving birth to vengeance. And that will play out. The year of this prophecy, around 740 B.C., seven years later, 733 B.C., there's a battle where the Assyrian general, um, Shalmaneser, comes and he takes most of the northern kingdom and it's a battle that occurs at the, at the place that is known as Jezreel. And then many, many in the northern kingdom are carried off into captivity. And by the way, 11 years later, uh, another Assyrian king comes back and completely, utterly destroys the, the northern kingdom. So, so uh, basically then God is telling us about our relationship with him 
due to our sin. And it's, it's really, it's not a particularly uh, pretty picture, is it? And then Gomer conceives again. It says that Gomer conceives again, but it doesn't say that she conceives from Hosea. It's left a little bit vague here. And by the time we get to Loami, we're pretty sure she conceives all right, but she's now working as a prostitute. So she perce- she uh, conceives almost certainly from another man. So <clears throat> Gomer has another child, and it's a daughter, and she's called Lo Ruhama. And Ruhama means love or compassion or mercy. So basically, as a daughter, and she's named No Mercy. Why? Because God is going to have no mercy. You know, we think of God as a God of love, as a, as a God of Ruhama. And we're going to find out later in this prophecy, absolutely God is a God of Ruhama, a God of mercy and love. But I'm telling you this, you don't mess with God, because God is also a God of vengeance. And if we put ourselves in opposition to the creator of the universe, then we, like Israel, we will become lo ruhama, which is not mercy, not compassion. And amazingly, Hosea followed the uh, command of God and named his daughter lo ruhama. Then he has another child. This is his second son. And, you know, we have to understand that outside of Christ, we were lo ruhama. And by the way, outside of Christ, we were Loami, as we'll see. So his third child is called Loami, which means not my people. That's Hosea 1, 8 and 9. So he has a daughter, Lo Rahama, not mercy. And he has a son, not my people. And what was Israel proud of? What Israel was proud of is that they were the people of God. They were the chosen people of God. And God's saying, no more. If you continue in your idolatry and your sin and your rebellion, you are not my people and you will not have mercy. Pretty tough stuff. But if we live a life of idolatry, and I don't know about you, but I absolutely lived a life of idolatry for my first 23, almost 24 years, then I was Loami. I was not the people of God. And I was Lo Rahama. I was... It's not that God didn't love me because God's love is unrelenting. But that's not what I was experiencing at that time. And that's definitely not what I've experienced if I had stayed in that state. Let's go to 1 Peter 2.10. And 1 Peter 2.10 is sort of anticipating uh, what's going to happen in the rest of Hosea chapter 1 and Hosea chapter 2. I'm guessing that a few of you, when you hear, not my people... And no mercy. Probably a few of you are thinking, don't, isn't there a scripture we use in one of the studies we do? It kind of is like that. You're right. It's 1 Peter 2.10. Let's go to 1 Peter 2.10. And basically, Peter's going to say what I've already been saying, which is not my people, no mercy. That was all of us at one time. 1 Peter 2.10. I'm going to go back to verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had received no mercy, but now you have received mercy. Once you were lo ami, but now you are ami. Once you were lo rahama, but now you are rahama. And I, I've studied the Bible with I don't know how many people. I'm sure I've used this verse a hundred times. And I can't, I, I can't imagine, it's hard to count the number of times I said to somebody, so which are you? Are you Ruhama or Lo Ruhama? Are you Ami or Lo Ami? And the typical answer is, I think I'm sort of kind of somewhere in between. But there is no in-between state here. There just isn't. And that, that is a basic teaching of the Bible. Now let's go back to Hosea 1. And, uh, let's, let's, uh, look at the good news. So basically, uh, our, our, uh, our, uh, verses today are bad news, but good news, but bad news, but good news. It's the way it's gonna go here. 
So uh, let's put a but after Hosea 1 verse 9. But, actually the word is yet. Let's read Hosea 1 10 through chapter 2 verse 1. Yet, the Israelites will be like the sand of the seashore. Now, God, help me out here. You just said that you're going to wipe us out and that we're not your people. We're not, no mercy because I have no mercy. And then he says, yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore. What are you talking about, God? You're really confusing me here. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, lo ami, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader. They will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. Save your brothers, my people, and of your sisters, my loved one. And see, that's the thing. God is always faithful to his covenant. God is committed to hesed, which is covenant love, loyal love, unending, unremitting love. I wouldn't say unconditional love, but I would say unrelenting love. God says, you know, I'm still holding to my covenant. And, and when I read uh, Hosea 1.10, I'm reminded of Genesis 22.17. And in Genesis 22.17, God says to Abraham, I swear, I swear that your children will be like the sand of the, of the, of the sea. Sand on the seashore. And that's right after Abraham had been willing to sacrifice his one and only son on Mount Moriah. And so, even as God is pronouncing judgment on Israel for their blatant idolatry and rejection of him, God is saying, that doesn't mean my promise is not still true. I am still faithful. And there will be a coming into the kingdom. And what's he talking about? He's talking about the church. This is a prophecy. This is a kingdom prophecy because he says there's going to be a time where there's going to be one ruler, one leader who will come up out of the land. And you know who that is? That's Jesus. That single ruler is Jesus. In, in verse 11, he says, Judah and Samaria will come back together. So, uh, that would be northern kingdom and southern kingdom. Now, Historically, when a Samar- when Syria, Assyria, sorry, destroyed the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom was never really ever reproduced. The people were scattered. Some of them did come into Judah, but basically the northern kingdom was wiped out never more. So when he says that Judah and Samaria will be a people, again, I believe he's talking about in the kingdom of God, in the church, where Jew and Gentile, so that would be like Samaria would be Gentile and Judah would be like Jew. So God will bring people together. And, and these, these the people of God, the unrelenting love of God will be given to the people through that one single ruler who will come. And that is Jesus Christ. So this sermon, this, this lesson, although it's in the Old Testament, Jesus is totally in the scene here. And then he says, the kingdom will be called Jezreel. I thought Jezreel meant vengeance. What does? But it also means God plants. And every one of us today either were Jezreel or we are Jezreel. I hope you're the second of, oh, sorry. I hope you're the first of the two that you were Jezreel. But we were not God's people. And we were not receiving mercy. And we were receiving vengeance. But if we will come back to the love of God, the unrelenting love of God, God is telling us that there will be one leader who will be appointed over us. And I love chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Save your brothers, my people. Remember, the the, lo ami, that was the son. So he says, Say to my brothers, not lo ami, but... Ami. And then say to your sisters, remember Lo Rahama was a girl, say to your sisters, my loved one. That's how God sees it. If we are in Christ, 
We are not low. I mean, we are. I mean, we are God's people. I think about Ephesians two. We are the people of God. Once we've not received mercy, now we've received mercy. Once we we're not the people of God, but now we're the people of God. This is beautiful, amazing, spectacular, wonderful good news. But, <laughs> but, now let's read Hosea 2, 2 through 13. You know, there's two sides of the coin here. And uh, there's a consistency in the prophets where you hear both the renunciation of idolatry, of an injustice, of unfaithfulness, and but God's unrelenting love, his offer of the opportunity to repent and come back into a relationship with him. So let's read Hosea 2, 2 through 13, which is not happy stuff. Rebuke your mother. Rebuke her. It's, it's, this is very emotional here because figuratively, Hosea is speaking to Jezreel, Lo Rahama, and Lo Ami and saying to his kids, Hey, you guys, talk to your mother. You know, have a little conversation with your adulterous prostitute mother. This is a really emotional scene here. Rebuke your mother. Rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face. Who's he talking about? He's talking about you and me. He's talking about what we were and what we could be again if we don't maintain faithful love for God. That's who he's talking about. Is he talking about Israel? Yeah. Is he talking about his wife? Yeah. He's talking about us as well, though. I believe he is. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. Otherwise, I'll strip her naked and make her as bare as on the day she was born. I will make her like a desert, turn her into a parched land and slay her with thirst. I will show my love. I will, sorry, I will not show my love to her children because they are the children of adultery. And who's he saying this to? Her children. The mother has been unfaithful and has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I'll go after my lovers who give me my food and my water, my wool and my linen, my olive oil and my drink. Therefore, I'll block her path with thorn bushes. I will wall her in so that she cannot find her way. She will chase after her lovers, but not catch them. She will look for them, but will not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my husband as at first. For then I was better off than now. She has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the noon wine, and the oil, who lavished on her the silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I will take away my grain when it ripens, my new wine when it's ready. I will take back my wool and my linen intended to cover her naked body. So now I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of her lovers. No one will take her out of my hands. I will stop all her celebrations, her yearly festivals, her new moons. Now remember, he's talking about the nation of Israel, right? Those receiving this prophecy, you have to remember, they know exactly what he's talking about. We can't relate to that exactly, but try your best. I'm going to keep reading here. Try your best to put yourself into this scene here. I will ruin her vines, verse 12, and her fig trees, which she said were her pay from her lovers. I will make them a thicket, and wild animals will devour them. I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the bales. She decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but she forgot to, but me, she forgot to declares the Lord. That, that is every single one of us. We invented ways to sin. And we were completely, utterly ungrateful. So here he's talking about the vengeance and, and, and judgment for unfaithfulness. Now, there's two kinds of judgment that God has on his people. One is the judgment, which is really discipline, so that he can win them back. And then there's the final judgment, if we choose to live out our life in rebellion. And that's a whole other deal there, folks, because that is eternal. And it's not, it's not to bring us back. It's vengeance. It's just real. What was our situation before we came into Christ, before our salvation, we were completely ungrateful. We were completely unfaithful. And, and I don't know about you, but I had a number of different lovers. 
I was not into prostitution. I, <laughs> I did have some sexual sins in my life before I was a Christian. But, you know, it basically he's describing, he's describing Gomer chasing after all these things, hoping and just believing they'll fulfill that emptiness in her. But she's always left empty. No matter how many lovers she has, she feels nothing. She feels her life is going nowhere. She has a pimp. And the pimp says, hey, I got you covered. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of the food. I'll take care of the clothing. I'll take care of the shelter. I got it covered. No, you're good with me. Yeah, but it, it reminds me of, of John chapter 10 where, the, where Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what the world has for you. That's it. It, does, it, it, it looks good. You know, her, her clothes were nice. You know, well, prostitutes, you know, they dress to be attractive, I guess. You know, our vacation homes, our awesome jobs, our, our, our toys or whatever. It looks good. But when you start looking behind the scenes, what, what do you see? You see people have sold themselves to um, lovers, a lover other than God. And it hurts God. It, just think about how Hosea felt about his wife doing this. And she kept doing it. And how do you think he felt? How do you think God feels about the sin in our lives? You know, in verse 7, she's chasing after love in all the wrong places, correct? She's gonna, she's looking for a sense of fulfillment. She's looking for a sense of satisfaction. But you will never be satisfied by watching football. By, you know, buying nice stuff, by having the awesome kitchen, by having the perfect garden, by, by, you know, writing this book, or whatever those things that, that we look at the thing, we look for the world to fill us up, and that is what Gomer is doing, and that is a disaster, and it never works. So then in verse 9 through 12, God says, alright, well I got another strategy. She's going after these things, she's looking for fulfillment in them, because she's unfaithful to me, then God says, well, I'm going to take those away from her, right? Verse 9. I'll take away the grain when it ripens in the new wine. I'm, I'm going to allow her to suffer some stuff, you know? And for some of us, we can totally relate to that, you know? We went after the world, and it didn't fulfill us, and then it got even worse from there. It went from bad to worse. Then the world just chewed us up and ate us up, and we were in a world of hurt. Well, that's exactly where Gomer's going to end up. But you and I know where we're headed, right? Chapter 3, well, maybe you don't, we find out. Because Hosea still loves his wife. It's, it's amazing. So in verse 9 through 12, I'll take away from her the things she values, the grain, the wine, the wool, the celebrations, the, the, the really nice house, the, uh, the, the awesome career opportunities, the really great physique that allows you to uh, uh, win football games, right? Right, Dwayne? You're, you, Dwayne's got a pretty awesome physique. He, he, in fact, he's the best player on the team, I think. But you know what? If we're unfaithful, God will take those things away from us. Why? Well, because he loves us. That's, that's the reason. In verse 13, he says, I will punish her for her adultery. It, uh, but not because I hate her, but because I love her. And now, now we have, ah, uh, but remember, Terrible news, great news, terrible news. Now, great news. I, I, I so much love Hosea 2, uh, 14 through 23. This is such a beautiful poetry. So let's read it. Therefore, or we could say yet, yeah, or but, <laughs> I'm now going to allure her. Let's stop right there. Here is Hosea jilted by his lover. Two of his Children are of unknown parents' parentage, let's say. And she is spending the night anywhere she wants. She's dressing, you know, for her pimp and all that sort of stuff. And what does Hosea do? He puts on his best clothes. And he takes a shower. He puts on some cologne and he, and he combs his hair. Therefore, I'm now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness. I will speak tenderly to her. Then I will give her back her vineyards, and I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. 
There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. And that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the name of the Baals from your lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day I will make a covenant. That's a key word, a covenant for them. With the beasts of the fields, the birds in the sky, the creatures that move along the ground. Bow and sword and battle I will abolish from the land so that all may lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. On that day, I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth, and the earth will respond to the grain, and the new wine, and the olive oil, and they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. And I will say to the, those called not my people, you are my people. First Peter 2, verse 10, correct? And they will say, you are my God. See, while we were out gallivanting and cavorting with all kinds of sinful things, God was plotting. He was planning for a way to get us back. God wooed us. Uh, in verse 15, it's really cool. It, it's, it says that I will make the valley of Achor. And Achor uh, basically means trouble. I will make it a possibility of hope. So God says... I'm going to use the the suffering that I brought into your life in, in the hopes that somehow you'll get go to the bottom of the pit, just like the prodigal son did. And, and from the bottom of the pit, maybe you'll remember my love. And just like she said, you know, um, in verse 7, I will go back to my husband as a first. God's just hoping, he's, he's begging that will happen. God is trying to woo us back. And think how foolish Hosea looks. Hosea's friends are saying, dude, what's wrong with you? She's been totally unfaithful to you for years. She has spit in your face, treated you blatantly, disrespectfully, and now you're dressing up for her? What's wrong with you? The love of God is irrational. It is unquenchable. It is unrelenting. That's what Hosea is about. It reminds me of, of Romans 5.8. It says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. It says, I'll make the valley of Achor, of trouble, a door of hope. God will allow you to go through trouble, even disaster. So that somehow, maybe you would come back. How does this make you feel? How does it make you feel that we who have been completely ungrateful and unfaithful to God, we have showed low said, and yet God has been faithful to us. No matter how unfaithful we have been to him, he will always be faithful to us. God says, I still want to be married to you. I still want to have that intimate relationship with you, even though you've been in Egypt for a very long time. And he says, you're going to call me my husband again. And I, we're going to reestablish the covenant. Here, I feel like we're in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. You can put that in notes, read it later. Uh, where it says, I'm going to give you a new covenant. It won't be like the former covenant. He says in verse 19, I will betroth you forever in righteousness, in love, in hesed, in compassion. By the word, that word compassion is rahama. Oops, sorry about that. Oh, that's my daughter. Oh, I feel bad. All right. What is God's dowry? What is God giving? I believe his dowry for us is this faithfulness. In verse 20 it says, And you will acknowledge the Lord. A Probably a better translation of you will acknowledge the Lord is you will know the Lord. In Jeremiah 31, 34 it says, All alike will know me. 
They will have the knowledge of me, that intimate understanding through the Holy Spirit living in us. And in verse 22, it says, parched land will become Jezreel. It'll become, and, and so your, your own personal parched land, your, your empty life, because you'd given yourself to every kind of lover other than God. God says, I'm going to plant it anew. And it, the, the earth will respond to the grain and the new wine and the olive oil. And again, just get the picture here of this beautiful metaphor for the relationship that God wants to have with us. Verse 23, let me read it again. I just, I just love this passage. This passage is quoted by Paul in Romans 9.25. He says, I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. And I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. And in, in, in Romans 9, he's applying, he's applying it to the Gentiles, which God is saying, even though you were never, ever my people, even you will be my people. And I don't know about you, but I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. All right, let, let's finish out. We're going to finish out in, in, in Hosea 3, 1 through 5, where basically, God, as, the, as is God, so is Hosea. Because Hosea is completing the story of God's unrelenting love for us. Let's read Hosea 3, verses 1 through 5. The Lord said to me, Go, show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. I don't know about those sacred raisin cakes. They must have tasted pretty good. Actually, I think it's a reference to, uh, pagan and idolatrous worship. So I brought her, I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley, which is about six bushels of barley. That's a lot of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man. And I'll behave the same way towards you. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods. Afterwards, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. You know who that is. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. As with God, so with Hosea. To me, Hosea chapter 3 has got to be ranked in just right near the very top of encouraging passages in the entire scripture. Because this is God's love for us. Does that mean that there's no judgment. It doesn't mean it at all. Just read the rest of the chapter. Go on to chapter 4, verse 1, and find out what God did to Israel. But we get the sense that God, he, he would do anything to win us back. But he won't force us to come home. He did not drag Gomer home. So what did he do? Uh, uh, the commentary commentator I read uh, says basically what he paid for was equivalent to roughly 30 shekels of silver. And in Exodus 21, 32, it says the price of a slave is 30 shekels. So basically he paid the price to the pimp to buy his wife back from the pimp as if he would ever owe the pimp anything. Because God owes the world nothing. And yet He paid the price. He paid the price for us to come back. And for us, the price was not 30 shekels, folks. It was the precious blood of Jesus. We were bought at a much bigger price than 30 shekels. We were slaves. We were in Egypt. We had prostituted ourselves to every kind of sin. But God came to our hemp, essentially, which would be Satan, and he bought us back at a very big price. I mean, the scene here is shocking. I mean, we read this, but would this ever actually happen? Would any human being love, would any man love a woman like this? Yet God did. 
God's unfailing love, his heroic love, his unrelenting love. That's what Hosea's life is all about. And, you know, Hosea is kind of caught up in this story. This was not Hosea's plan, you know. He, I guarantee you, he would have never thought of this. You know who's learning the most from this thing? Probably the person learning the most from this thing. Maybe it's Gomer, and maybe it's Hosea, and maybe even it's Gomer's pimp. I don't know if he came around or not. Maybe so. But how about you and how about me? I believe after these scenes, Hosea got it. Hosea's like, man, it's tough. This has been tough work. But now he understands God's love. What would God not do to take you back? Well, the one thing he would not do to take you back is to say it's okay to go back into unfaithfulness. And that's what goes on here uh, in verse 3. Like I said, unrelenting love, but not necessarily unconditional love. He says, I'm going to take you back, but honestly, uh, there was a time where, you know, like, he waited. It seems like he waited for a little while to see if she was going to stay pure. That's what he did. But then she did, and then he took her back. And in verse 5, Messianic prophecy afterward, because the background here is, uh, within about, about, 11 years or so, about, I'm sorry, a, a little bit more than 15 years of this prophecy, the northern kingdom of Samaria was completely, utterly, unrelentingly destroyed. 722 BC. 750 years later, this prophecy is fulfilled. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord. And who is that? That is you. And that is me. Because like Paul said, not all Israel is Israel. And circumcision is not circumcision of the flesh, but circumcision of the heart. And in Colossians 2, it says baptism is that circumcision. So afterwards, the Israelites return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. That's the story. That's the story of Hosea, it's a story of God's un, irrational almost, his, his insane love for us, no matter how unfaithful we've been. Now, here's, this, let me say this, this is not the message of the sermon. Therefore, go out and sin that grace might increase. No, don't do that. Let us see God's love. Let's come back and let us have that kind of relationship. Let's be betrothed to God. If you've never been baptized into Christ, if you've been studying or, or you, you know, you've kind of been playing around with Christianity, now is the time to come back, to throw off those lovers and come back into the arms of God because God wants to be betrothed with you through that a great one leader in chapter one, verse 11. And through that king, that Davidic king in chapter 3, verse 5, let us come back to Jesus. Thank you very much. Thank you, John Oaks, and thank you all for listening to Deeper Dive by the OC Church of Christ. If you want to get connected to us or want to donate to the program, go to our website, occhurchofchrist.com, or through social media at the OC Church. Join us next time as we continue our deeper dive into the Minor Prophets. Oh, oh, oh.